Speaking next is Ken Rothman, Professor of Epidemiology at BU, author of the famous textbook and co-author with Demetrius five times, first time in 1980, maternal age and birth rank of women with breast cancer 35 years ago in JNCI. Thank you, David. <clears throat> and I'm very grateful to uh, Michelle, to Antonia, for this opportunity to be here today to talk about my friend Demetrius. I met Demetrius um, about a year or so after he came to Harvard. I knew him almost 45 years. And during that time, we were mainly friends. We were working in the same field, but um, we didn't collaborate that much. Just a handful of papers that we co-authored, these would be less than a rounding error on Demetrius's CV. Um, but we, we, of course, talked a lot about epidemiology, and we, we got together many times. But I'm going to talk about one project that he brought to me that we did collaborate on. And, and this follows a bit in the uh, spirit of what uh, Bert was focusing on with the natural experiment. Uh, and it's in contrast to a lot of what we've heard this morning uh, because a lot of it has been on cancer and a lot of it had, has been on the micro aspects of causation, which Demetrius was so expert in. But he also was interested in uh, other aspects of public health, in coronary disease, for example. And uh, he was also interested in macro issues as well as micro. So uh, here is a, um, an exercise that we worked on where he was interested in coronary mortality and the environment. So the background for this is that mortality from coronary disease is declining, but still remains a major public health problem. Uh, it's long been known also that coronary mortality is greater in the winter than other times of the year. So it has a seasonal pattern. Demetrius was interested in understanding whether this seasonal pattern has changed. Uh, now, there, there are special reasons to be interested in uh, cyclic variation. So let me tell you, I'm going to discuss a little bit about cyclic variation, why we study it. Some of that is pretty obvious. And talk about the methodology of a moment before we get to the specific analysis that we did. Uh, cyclic variation refers usually to cycles in the time scale. There are other ways to look at cyclic variation, but I th think almost all of it is with reference to time. Um, one of the reasons that it's so important is because if you see a cyclic pattern, that uh, reflects a pattern of cyclic causation. So some, something that's causing it is cycling in the same period, the same frequency as uh, the observations that you make. And there are many potential confounding factors that don't exhibit that pattern that can be ruled out. So the analyses tend to be simple, and they tend to focus attention on a narrower set of possible causes. So when we have cyclic variation in disease occurrence, that generally implies that there is some corresponding cyclic variation in environmental causes. Now, this slide just uh, defines a cyclic function. Uh, that is, it's a, it's a function of a variable. In this case, it would be a function of time, uh, where the function takes on a value that's exactly the same uh, after you add a constant. The constant is p, and that refers to the period. So it's a, a function that keeps repeating itself. And uh, it's, because of that, it's pretty easy to model. Uh, the cyclic pattern is usually modeled by a simple trigonometric curve, such as a cosine curve or a sine curve, which is what we have pictured here. Most of the time when uh, scientists, or well, I should say much of the time, when scientists have studied cyclic variation, they have um, spread the data, let's say we're looking at uh, annual cycles, they spread the data into quarters of the year and they do a kind of pathetic uh, chi-square test to see if they get a significant result. And that's the extent of the analysis. Uh, a better approach is to model it and to try to describe the intensity of the seasonal pattern. So we need a way to measure 
the cyclic pattern, the intensity of the cyclic pattern. And that was crucial to the aim that Demetrius had when he brought this problem to me because he wanted to see if the intensity of the cyclic variation in coronary mortality had been changing over time. So we needed to measure it. Well, how do you measure intensity of a cyclic pattern? It's actually uh, pretty straightforward. So if you have a cyclic curve here, and imagine that this blue curve is showing you the frequency of disease occurrence over some period of time. If you model it, then you can take a look at the peak that the modeled curve reaches, and you can take a look at the low point. And we have basically two, two ways to measure the intensity, two simple ways. One is to just measure the hemi amplitude, which is the departure from the average to the peak or to the low. And a second way is to take the ratio of the peak to the low. So this peak to low ratio is, is something that we might interpret as similar to relative risk. Uh, we can think about it the same way. If there's no seasonality or no cyclic pattern, that ratio would be one. And then the larger it gets, the stronger the seasonality. And that was the, me the measure that we chose to use. So we use a peak to low ratio. And well, this, uh, this is just showing you an uh, example of the sine and cosine functions, which are basically the same curve, just out of phase 90 degrees. And typically, it's one of these curves that is used to model seasonality. Now, this slide is uh, intended to demonstrate why you should be glad that you studied trigonometry. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> maybe not so glad. Um, but I, I just wanted to point out a couple of, a couple of things. So the, the top line here is the, the most elementary function for a model of um, a cyclic pattern, where we have the, the occurrences that occur. That would be y, which we're modeling as, uh, first of all, a constant. The a sub 0 is the average occurrence per unit. Now, if, if you, let's say we're looking at monthly occurrences, and which is what we actually did. So uh, the average number of cases occurring in a month would be A0. And then we uh, have a departure from that average that reflects, the, in this case, it's a cosine function. Now, the cosine only goes up to maximum of 1 and down to minus 1. So you can't, if you have an average number of cases, you can't just add or subtract 1. We have to have a multiplier for that. And the multiplier, the capital A, is this hemi amplitude that uh, it, you multiply by the cosine function, tells you how much to add to get to the peak or how much to subtract to get to the, the low point, the trough. The rest of it is uh, the cosine of x minus theta. x is the timing measured in angles, but it's the timing of occurrence. So if you're looking at a year at each month, uh, a year has 12 months, which each one is approximately 15 degrees around the 360-degree 300, circle. So x would change, if you had monthly data, f, x would change in increments of 30 degrees. But we have x minus theta. There's a, there's a little uh, correction to x. And the reason for that is that the cosine curve peaks when the uh, angle is 0. But that may not be the peak of your particular data. To allow for the peak to be whenever it actually occurs, we have to uh, adjust for that. So we use x minus theta, where theta is one of the parameters of this model. And it's, the, it's called the phase angle. It represents the timing of the peak occurrence. So uh, I'm going to skip the algebra here. But uh, what this algebra shows you is that when you uh, go down to the, the bottom, uh, the sec second line from the bottom, y is rewritten as a uh, function of a cosine term and a sine term. This is all just algebraically derived. But what we've done is we've converted the two parameters of interest in the top, the capital A and theta, into two uh, other parameters, the a1 and the b1, which are regression coefficients and can be readily estimated. And then we use the Pythagorean theorem and some trigonometry to estimate the hemi amplitude and the phase angle. There's actually an even simpler way to fit this kind of model that was uh, published more than 50 years ago in a paper by Edwards 
Uh, these data that I'm showing you here are Edwards' uh, sample data from his publication, but it was a simple way to fit this kind of cyclic model. The uh, column in the middle shows you the number of degrees that's assigned to each monthly frequency, and he, he was looking at the number of anisonphallic births in each month, and note uh, I put in red here the highest frequencies that occurred. These are data that were summed over a few years. And you can see that the four highest frequencies occurred within a narrow span of months. It was definitely a seasonal pattern here. But what Edwards' method allows you to do, here's a plot of those monthly frequencies, and then that superimposed on that is this um, cyclic function, which is a, a sine, sine curve or cosine curve fitting these frequencies. Well, this is what we did. And for the Edwards example data, the peak to low ratio was 1.8. And the timing of the peak was one degree, which meant beginning of the year. Uh, this is exactly what we did with the data that Demetrius had amassed. He had, a, working with a, a student and some others, he had brought the data to me in, in the form of a big spreadsheet where he had the monthly number of deaths from uh, coronary mortality uh, for the total U.S. for every month of the year over more than a 50-year period. This is a screenshot of the actual spreadsheet, which I still have, uh, and these are, these are large numbers, okay? These are the numbers of deaths in each month. And uh, so this Edwards method is very simple to do in a spreadsheet calculation. It was easy to add that and uh, get another column that measured the strength of a seasonal occurrence in each one of these years. And from that, um, well, there was, there was plenty to discuss. And as, uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, this collaboration with Demetrius, which was a lot of fun for me, and I think it was for him too, it was also very contentious, which is probably not unusual for collaborations with Demetrius. Um, but I added to the spreadsheet the uh, intensity of the seasonal occurrence. By the way, we also knew the time of, of the peak, and it was mid midwinter for pretty much every year. And here are the main results. These are the data that we got. Uh, Demetrius was very excited about this. He loved this. Uh, so here we have plotted the peak to low ratio. So the higher it is, the more intense the seasonality. Uh, for every year spanning from the mid-30s to the mid-90s for the US. And uh, his, his uh, theory, of course, um, maybe it's not obvious, but uh, his basic theory is that the seasonality would be declining. And the reason is that uh, the seasonal peak in winter comes from environmental exposure to cold. And as time went by, especially during the early years of this time span, fewer people were exposed to cold conditions. Uh, Demetrius was interested not just in molecules, but in big public health issues. And he, uh, he talked about how people move from the suburbs uh, into cities, how they uh, created work environments that fewer worked outside. Those who did work outside worked in enclosures that were heated, so that the effect of cold affected fewer people. And for that reason, we saw a declining trend. But then he said to me, Ken, what do you think? Don't you think it's going up on the right? I mean, look at from 1970 on, would you say it's going up? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe, Demetrius. I mean, you could also say it's flat. It sounds kind of arbitrary. Um, he said, I think it's going up. He said, in fact, let's do this. Let's cut it at 1970 and fit two regression lines. One fitting the downtrend before that, and the other one, you'll see, it'll be an uptrend after that. I said, I don't know, Demetrius. Uh, I'm not an ardent uh, proponent of the idea that you have to pre-specify everything. On the other hand, I think that would be hard to defend, uh, that we just pick 1970 and we fit these two regression lines. I, but I made a counterproposal. I said, here's what we'll do, Demetrius. We're going to fit a smoother here. So we fit the Savisky-Golay smoother, which is, uh, takes a window, like a moving average, of a few points, five points, fits a high-order polynomial to that, and then moves the, uh, moves the ob observation to the line. And then you move the window across the data, and you get a result that looks like this. He loved this. <laughs>
This was perfect. He says, I told you so. I told you it was going up. Of course, there was an explanation for why it was going up. The explanation is a little bit complicated, but the way it works is like this. Uh, there is an effect of winter, but there's also an effect of heat waves in summer. People do have cardiac uh, deaths because of exposure to heat. And that summer peak, when it occurred, which didn't account for as many deaths, apparently, as the winter peak, but it would offset the seasonality in the winter. And nothing really changed, according to Demetrius, up until 1970. But after 1970, what became more common is that people had air conditioning. And there was less of a summer peak. And that was, therefore, le offsetting less the winter peak. And so the seasonality got more intense after 1970. So he really loved that, uh, that increase. We also uh, made a few other comparisons. For example, we decided to take the summer out of it, just compare winter to spring and fall. And um, what we found was not very impressive. I mean, a little bit of decline and then kind of flattening out and a lot of scatter. But Demetrius could explain this. Uh, the reason for this is that, as you know, the heating season in the United States is roughly nine months for most of the, uh, most of the country. And therefore, there's probably an environmental effect on those shoulder months in the spring and in the fall. And he felt that the comparing winter to this, these shoulder seasons was not a good comparison because whatever was affecting winter would be affecting those, uh, those uh, other months as well. And that's why this was so messy. But he said, that shouldn't happen when we look at summer compared to the shoulder seasons. And there we saw much less variability. Uh, and we saw the, uh, the increase here shows that the, uh, it's the reverse of the winter peak because what we see is the effect of cold on the shoulder months. That's the reference point here, whereas the summer months stay the same up until about 1970. And then it starts going down because of air conditioning. There were a couple of other graphs, but I've run out of time, so I'll skip those uh, and just go to my final slide. The, um, the comments in this, uh, from this analysis were that the decline in seasonality was compatible with an effect of heating in our, our environment, the environment we find ourselves in, that countered the outdoor effect of, of cold. This may have something to do with migration from rural areas. Uh, and um, then there was the benefit, of, uh, the, the benefit of heating that might have affected the results in the spring and the fall months, but not the summer. And finally, the reversal in 1970 and subsequent years attributable to air conditioning. So we had a lot of fun arguing about this, and we enjoyed the collaboration. Thank you very much.